Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, I'm Roy Herbst. I'll be the moderator today. Um, just as we start, I just want to remind everyone that this Friday uh, from 8 to 12.30 is our annual uh, review of ASCO. And um, I'm very excited. This is uh, the 10th year I'll be doing it, but we had it in, in place a number of years before that. Eddie used to run it. And um, it should be a very nice review. Barbara, already one of you are probably speaking on head and neck cancer. So um, another chance to hear, hear them. And then uh, there'll be a very special 35, 40 minutes around 11 o'clock where Vince DeVita and his daughter Elizabeth and a few questions for myself as well, will discuss a little bit about the 50th anniversary of the National Cancer Act. Yeah, so that should be very exciting. So um, now I'm gonna introduce today's uh, uh, speakers. I'll introduce all three of you and then um, I'll let Barbara moderate through the, uh, the, the presentations and then we'll have questions at the end. And one of the things we've been doing is we've been uh, highlighting our darts or disease teams uh, at these grand rounds. And it's a great way to develop uh, multi-modality uh, discussions, uh, interaction between the disease programs uh, and the research programs of the Cancer Center. So we're very excited. We have a group today, uh, uh, a tremendous team. Uh, uh, the first speaker will be Dr. Barbara Burtness. Barbara is a professor of medicine and medical oncology and disease aligned research team leader for head and neck cancer. She was recently named as Interim Associate Cancer Center Director for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Congratulations, Barbara. She received her medical degree from SUNY at Stony Brook, completed her residency at Yale, and her fellowship at Memorial Sloan Kettering. Uh, she was then on faculty, of course, at Yale. She left in, and she's come back. Dr. Burtness is an internationally recognized leader in the treatment of head and neck cancer and as chair of the ECOG Akron Head and Neck uh, Therapeutics Committee since 2006 pioneering biomarker-guided treatment and treatment uh, de-intensification de studies in this disease. She also leads the Yale Head and Neck Spore, uh, recently awarded, uh, finished, just finished the first year, which addresses critical barriers to treatment of head and neck and squamous cell carcinoma due to resistance to immune, DNA damaging, and targeted therapy. So welcome, Barbara. Uh, also on the panel this morning, or this afternoon, is Ori Bhatia. Uh, Dr. Bhatia is an assistant professor of medicine in medical oncology. She received her medical degree from Tapawa National Medical College and her MPH from the University of Texas School of Public Health. She completed her residency at Johns Hopkins University Sinai Hospital and a fellowship at Temple University Fox Chase Cancer Center. Dr. Bhatia treats patients with head and neck cancers and her research interests include exploring novel therapies for patients. She designs and conducts clinical trials and also serves as a site PI for several multi-center studies. And then last but not least, from radiation oncology, we have Melissa Young. Uh, Dr. Young is an assistant professor of therapeutic radiology and chief of the head and neck radiotherapy program. She completed her MD PhD training as part of the medical scientist training program at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas. She then continued her training in radiation oncology at Yale and stayed and joined our faculty in 2015. Dr. Young treats patients as part of the Head and Neck Cancer's Multidisciplinary Clinic at the Smile Cancer Hospital Care Center in Trumbull, and also specializes in breast and gynecologic malignancies. So finally, just a quick word, the Head and Neck Cancer's DART um, provides expert multidisciplinary care for head and neck cancer patients, and aims to advance new research and to force the next generation of head and neck uh, uh, cancer translational researchers through a developmental research program, a career enhancement program, and interaction and collaboration with the wider SPORE and head and neck squamous cell cancer research communities. So what an amazing team. I've used up five of your minutes introducing you. You're also qualified. <laughs> I'm gonna stop. I'm gonna turn it over to you, Barbara. Uh, one of the best things that uh, ever happened here at Yale for me in my 10 years is when you came and joined us. And uh, you know, Barbara and I worked together 20 years ago uh, in the early days of Tuximab. So Barbara, thank you for all you've done and uh, the floor is yours. Okay, well, um, thank you for that very kind introduction and um, uh, for recruiting me back. And um, I'm also very grateful to have the opportunity to talk about what we've been doing in the, in the Head and Neck Dart. Um, as you heard, the way we're gonna um, do this is um, uh, tag team. I'm gonna spend about half an hour trying to do a, 
a world whirlwind tour of uh, some of what our DART has been up to, uh, then turn it over to Dr. Bhatia to talk about um, some of the clinical trials she's been developing and her collaboration uh, with the SPORE, and then uh, to Dr. Young, who leads our uh, therapeutic radiation efforts in this area. So just a brief introduction to our clinical membership. Um, the uh, nature of, of head and neck cancer, uh, given its anatomic complexity, its tendency to treatment resistance, um, it has been uh, that very clearly outcome is improved when um, patients get uh, surgery and radiation at, at high volume centers. And um, so we have a, a dedicated focus on, on trying to um, have uh, pockets of, of excellence around the state. So in addition to the um, program at SMILO, there are hubs for um, head and neck cancer multidisciplinary care, um, including at Trumbull and Lawrence and Memorial. I know Emily Collier is going to be uh, joining us at um, St. Francis. So um, it's, a, it's a terrific team, uh, a lot of fun to work with, with everybody. The um, patients who present with, with head and neck cancer often come with locally advanced disease, so local regionally invasive um, and not metastatic, and may um, present many times in uh, a curative uh, state or cur potentially curable stage. But um, these tumors are located in areas that are very critical for speech and swallowing and taste and appearance and, and um, many of the things that we do to interact with, with other people. So having a conversation, sharing a meal, singing, um, all of these things can be impacted by either the cancer or the treatment for the cancer. Treatments are further constrained um, by some anatomic peculiarities like the carotid artery in the base of the skull. And even patients who are successfully treated may be left with very significant um, impairment, functional uh, restriction, and actually may succumb to the consequences of their treatment even when they are cured. So there's a lot of work to do to improve our standard of care even when it's curative. And as well, there are a lot of, uh, I think, areas of difficulty in um, the science underlying or the biology underlying head and neck cancer. So um, Roy mentioned that, that he and I first worked together in the context of cetuximab, and, and it was a thrill when we saw that uh, lead to responses as a, as a single agent in head and neck cancer. But it's clear that both constitutive resistance and adaptive resistance greatly limit the utility of EGFR inhibitors and, and other uh, HER family inhibitors. The uh, genome of, of head and neck cancer is uh, dominated by mutations in tumor suppressor genes. So this has been uh, very difficult to target. Um, there, there are not a lot of successes with um, kinase inhibitors of activated oncogenes in this disease. Although um, we have activity for um, immune checkpoint in inhibition, and I'll briefly show you some of those data, uh, the effect of immunotherapy is more modest in head and neck cancer than in many other solid tumors. And part of this story certainly lies in the tumor microenvironment, which is hostile to immune effector cells because of hypoxia, expression of IDO, macrophage polarization, very high abundance of myeloid-derived suppressor cells, and um, lymphocyte-excluded phenotypes of the cancer. We have a, a new kind of head and neck cancer over the past 15, 20 years, which is driven by human papillomavirus, um, which uh, uh, gives us both an immune uh, target and, and, and maybe um, also a way to interfere with uh, the, the um, signaling that, that drives these cancers. But there has been pretty low success in targeting HPV as a driver of head and neck cancer. We see very grave disparities in outcome in HPV negative cancers between black patients and um, other groups. And although much of this is, is explained by socioeconomic factors, it's becoming clearer that there are ancestry-based differences in treatment response as well. And these have, have kind of been uh, lost in a pool of trials that did not include uh, a lot of patients of African ancestry. And then the field as a whole has historically suffered from underinvestment in clinical trials and low access to, to new patients, uh, uh, to, to new agents uh, for our patients. So what I'd like to quickly do is talk a little bit about multidisciplinary clinical care here, uh, how we address problems in our catchment area, a few highlights of our clinical research portfolio, um, some of the correlative and translational science that is going on, um, some of our translation to the 
uh, cooperative group network, um, engagement with policy, and then career development. And then part of career development will be turning it off to my two very talented junior colleagues. Multidisciplinary care, I mentioned that high, high case volume is important. And so you see here, at least from the pre-pandemic numbers, um, our uh, surgical volumes for oral cavity, pharynx, and larynx cancer. Um, we have a multidisciplinary tumor board that uh, brings together uh, surgery, radiation, medical oncology, neuroradiology, pathology, and speech language pathology, uh, which helps us to uh, make treatment recommendations that optimize both our drive for cure and the need to think about the functional consequences of treatment for our patients. We've rolled out chemo radiation supportive care uh, order sets across the, the health system. We work very closely with speech language pathology on function preservation, beginning with prehab before the surgery or, or chemo radiation even begins. And uh, we have dedicated social work to help with many of the, the problems with employment um, that, and, and other socioeconomic problems that, that this group of patients encounters. Sarah Mera, one of our, um, or the, the leader of our head and neck uh, surgical oncology program, uh, introduced a clinic, clinical care pathway for reducing ICU uh, usage in head, neck cancer, microvascular reconstruction. And you can see here these absolutely stunning data, not only lowering the average length of stay to a week for very complicated, large uh, reconstructive uh, surgeries, but also um, bringing ICU stays from 100% to 6% and dramatically reducing unplanned 30-day um, readmission. Within our catchment area, New Haven County is um, well documented to have excess rates of tobacco use relative to national rates. And in lower income adults in New Haven, use is uh, twice as high. Oral cavity cancer is increasing dramatically in Connecticut and is 50% higher in the Latinx population in the state. So we have a very significant focus on the, trans on the tobacco associated malignancies. Um, we have trials, and, and Arti Bhatia will speak later ab about one of them, but moving forward in um, the cooperative groups, international trials focused on HPV-negative disease, two of the projects in our Head and Neck Spore focus on HPV-negative disease, and um, in the uh, ECOG, ECOG Akron Health uh, uh, Head and Neck Committee that, that I lead, we are now um, developing health equity um, co-studies with many of our larger clinical trials. I mentioned that uh, the, dis the outcomes disparities for HPV negative head and neck cancer are among the most dramatic for any solid tumor. And uh, a collaborator of uh, mine from my time at Fox Chase, Camille Reagan, who's now part of our SPORE, has demonstrated that African ancestry informative markers are associated with overexpression of DNA polymerase beta and that this in turn is associated with platinum and radiation resistance. She's got uh, a large collection of patients in the temple system that she's um, sequencing. Um, it's highly enriched for African-American patients and we're collaborating with her to bring forward um, uh, patient-derived tissue resources for studying uh, alternative therapies to platinum and radiation in, the, in these patients. Um, we have a large clinical trial portfolio. Um, I, I don't want to um, go through it in detail, but I'll just emphasize that we um, always prioritize investigator-initiated trials. Uh, Dr. Bhatia will talk about the fatinib cetuximab work. I'll talk a little bit about uh, a trial for pembrolizumab and primary radiation resistance and the 5 ASA work. We have uh, phase one trials particularly focused on HPV therapeutic vaccines for HPV-associated cancer have um, participated or led some practice changing trials, including, not that we led it, but contributed to the cabozantinib uh, in uh, radioiodine refractory thyroid cancer uh, study that was presented at ASCO this year, and I think is really gonna change uh, the standard of care for lenvatinib refractory uh, disease and ongoing um, late phase trials in the chemo radiation setting. So let me tell you a little bit about this radio resistance trial. This was, um, uh, started by Zen Hussein when, when he was here before he left for Toronto. Um, and the uh, idea was that we had uh, patients in our practice, HPV uh, negative cancers predominantly, who had presented with uh, very advanced disease and had primary radio resistant 
um, disease. At, at that time, there was no standard of care uh, with immunotherapy for those patients. And so he put together a, a phase two trial for um, moving them right on to pembrolizumab with the advantage that we would have baseline tissue, uh, tissue from the biopsy that proved persistent disease. And if the patient uh, had become resectable by the end of four cycles of um, pembrolizumab, they would, they would go on to resection. So we um, are doing immunoprofiling on the, on the specimens from this uh, trial and um, also started sequencing them. And the first two cases that we sequenced both had this very unusual finding of um, whether new emergence or an enrichment for uh, mutation in uh, tenacin R, one of the tenacin family uh, proteins that controls EMT and um, can be involved in an immunosuppressive microenvironment. So we have just gone back and received funding to um, finish sequencing all the, the cases uh, here. And um, I think that this is potentially a very interesting lead into the biology of primary radio resistance. The pictures at the bottom just show you um, one of our patients who had a CR. He's now four years out. Um, just to, to switch gears now to some of the correlative work, uh, a long time ago, the ECOG committee had demonstrated that for patients who had undergone margin negative resection, but who had disruptive mutation of TP53, that they continued to have a, a pretty poor outcome despite getting risk-based uh, appropriate post-operative therapy. And um, that was done uh, with uh, older sequencing technology um, as next-gen sequencing came on and a number of new algorithms for calling p53 mutation became available. We undertook a comparison of all of these different um, classifying schemes in the uh, specimens from that ECOG trial, finding that our original rule, which was DNA uh, binding domain mutations or truncation mutations, um, somewhat supplemented with information about splice variants, really was the best predictor of um, bad outcome. And since p53 mutation is quite prevalent in head and neck cancer and difficult to target, this um, has, I think, really uh, helped us focus on the importance of understanding the biology of these p Barbara. Did we lose Barbara? Yeah, I um, look at her internet down. Okay, well, these things happen. There's the storms. Um, Who's, who's ready to step up? Oh, here she is, Barbara. You're, you're muted. Sorry about that. Um, so we sequenced these, or Karis had sequenced over a thousand HPV negative cancers. We classified the P53 mutation using a variety of different schemes. Barbara, looked at Barbara, you need to share your slides again. Oh, sorry. We'll give you two extra minutes at the end of the hour. Don't worry. <laughs> All right. Um, am I doing better now? Is this better? Perfect. Uh, looked at CDK and 2A mutations and then calculated um, tumor mutation burden. And so um, what was uh, quite interesting here was that either P53 or CDK N2A mutation was associated with higher tumor mutation burden with the exception of when that P53 mutation was a gain of function, not loss of function mutation. But that the co-occurrence of P53, CDK N2A um, mutation was associated with the highest uh, tumor mutation burden. And this came into the 15 uh, mutations per megabase range, which has been informative for response to immunotherapy. Um, uh, it's been understood for a long time that there's a, a range of uh, TMB across different kinds of 
both HPV positive and HPV negative head and neck cancers, both smokers and non-smokers, that this is associated with response to pembrolizumab. And more recently, in a, a randomized trial of Dervalumab that was actually negative uh, for all comers, if you focused on the group with high TMB, um, there was a survival advantage for the use of immunotherapy. So I think one thing this points us to is the early use of immunotherapy in um, P53 mutated uh, head and neck cancer. Um, and I'll maybe take a brief detour here because uh, this, is, this is work that um, uh, Yale investigators participated in before I arrived here and that I've been very involved with. Um, the Keynote 012 trial, which um, was the, the first large-scale study of immune checkpoint inhibition in head and neck cancer, uh, was done with pembrolizumab. We had a big focus on in including both HPV negative and HPV positive cancer, and you can see that uh, durable responses were seen in, in both types of head and neck cancer. And looking at the spider plot, I think that you see... Um, really what the next five years of, of research into immunotherapy in head and neck cancer um, has, has played out as because there are early and deep responses. There are somewhat slower responses, but that are deep and very durable. But there's a subset of patients who um, not only don't respond to immunotherapy, but appear to almost have accelerated um, uh, disease growth. And so we need to understand what's um, suppressive in the uh, tumor microenvironment that leads to this resistance and what it might be in the tumor microenvironment that's pdl one expressing that um, it's actually bad to turn off. So I think there, there's some, some work to be done there. Um, but given the strong signal with an 18% response rate and durable CRs in the treatment refractory setting, we moved this forward as a first-line trial in metastatic recurrent disease. And um, this had a, a little bit of a complicated design because we recognized that the standard of care, which was chemotherapy with cetuximab, actually had a higher response rate than pembrolizumab monotherapy, but it didn't have the same duration of response and it didn't have the same um, complete response rate. So we had two experimental arms. One was pembrolizumab alone and one was pembrolizumab with chemotherapy. Each of them independently compared to the standard of care of chemotherapy with cetuximab. And then we undertook a biomarker-driven analysis because the hypothesis was that those cases that express PDL1 the most richly might be the most likely to respond, and there um, the advantage over uh, chemo cetuximab would would be more readily apparent. Actually, pembrolizumab performed better than than we could have imagined. But so this is the CPS20 group, the highest PDL1 expressing, and um, you see here a hazard ratio of 0.61 in favor of pembrolizumab. We now have four-year data showing that, that this group has over a 20% four-year survival. This is all pdl one expressing uh, cancers, hazard ratios of 0.78. Um, and this was also statistically significant compared with the control arm. And then if you took all comers, so that includes the 15% that are pdl one um, negative, pembrolizumab was not inferior to um, chemotherapy cetuximab. Going back and looking at that PDL1 uh, subset, they uh, do substantially worse with pembrolizumab than with chemotherapy cetuximab. So they should not get pembrolizumab monotherapy. And then pembrolizumab plus chemotherapy uh, superior to uh, the reference regimen across all regimen, uh, across all uh, biomarker subgroups. So this study has, has been very fruitful. Subsequent um, publications coming out about uh, patient reported outcomes, the PDL1 subsets and long-term survival. Um, I'd like to introduce you to our um, head and neck spore team. So um, spores are um, uh, programs of uh, re research excellence, uh, usually centered around a, a given disease type. They, they need to have at least um, three projects and cores and developmental um, projects. And um, we received very generous uh, support from um, the Cancer Center and the medical school to jumpstart these um, projects. And um, uh, the first review had some, some comments that we had to address, um, but we uh, were funded uh, late last year. So we have uh, three projects, one on uh, targeting the EGFR family, and um, Artie Bhatia will talk about that more in a couple of minutes. Um, one on synthetic lethal therapy for predominantly P53 um, mutated cancer. I'll speak about that a little bit. And then Karen Anderson and Del Yarbrough uh, lead a project 
looking at demethylation to trigger APABEC-induced uh, synthetic lethality. Um, and I'll introduce that um, briefly as well. So I've been talking about P53 mutant cells really being um, sort of one of the, the last bastions of, of um, undruggable head and neck cancer. And we know that these cells exhibit impaired regulation of um, G1S um, checkpoints, increasing their dependence on the G2M transition to repair replication damage, creating vulnerability to inhibitors of these processes through DNA damage, G2 checkpoints, restraint of mitotic entry. And we have had um, an interest in, in this for a long time, going back to work uh, when I was at Fox Chase demonstrating that uh, aurora kinase overexpression in the nuclear compartment was associated with worse um, overall survival. We know that aurora is regulated by P53. And so if you look across these commonly used P53 mutated or null um, head and neck cancer cell lines, they all overexpress aurora relative to normal tissue. And so we um, began to look at using Aurora as um, an inhibitor, both preclinically and in the clinic. In the clinic, it had a 9% response rate, so that was obviously pretty disappointing. And what we found when we gave it uh, clinically, and this is with an, an agent called Alicertib, is that it, it did actually abrogate phosphorylation of Aurora. It, it did change uh, the function of Aurora. So we got these um, tri and quadrupolar spindles. Um, and, uh, and, and yet what happened was that the cells, I'm sorry, that the cells entered uh, really a cell cycle arrest that was mediated through phosphorylation of um, CDK1. As you see here, that, that inhibitory phosphorylation is placed by we one And so we combined the Aurora inhibitor with the we one inhibitor. we one is a regulator of um, mitotic entry. And you see here, when you give the, um, we one inhibitor, you accelerate mitotic entry and find these cells that are sort of held up in late mitosis. But when you give the two agents together, um, you precipitate mitotic catastrophe and the cells undergo an apoptotic cell death, as you can see here with the annexin 5 and Cleve Park. We um, treated animals with the combination. Um, their survival was markedly improved compared to either of the, the monotherapies. And um, tumor growth was really controlled. If you looked at these murine tumors under the microscope, you saw that the combination increased cleave caspase, reduced proliferation. Looking in the leading edge of these tumors using aqua, we could count phospho-CDK1 and it was markedly reduced. We've now moved to a more selective uh, second generation Aurora inhibitor, which we think will be easier to use in the clinic because it's not as myelosuppressive and been able to um, replicate these findings. And so part of our spore is to take this combination forward as a window trial in HPV negative disease going for um, resection with dose escalation and then an expansion cohort. Um, collaborating with the Galemis lab, we've done a high throughput screen to identify additional synergistic pairs um, or additional partners for adavacertib. And our strongest hit was with the check one, check two inhibitor, prexacertib. When I first saw, saw that come out, um, I was pretty discouraged because that's a pretty myelosuppressive agent in the clinic. And I was fearful that we wouldn't be able to use it in combination. But if you look here, you can see that even at 25 uh, nanomolar, we get uh, clonogenic uh, survival effects in combination. So um, these uh, pairs are going to be tested in animal models as part of our SPORE project. Um, I think in the interest of time, I will um, skip this, this sort of a uh, side branch story that we have trying to explore these therapies for patients with Fanconi anemia who develop head and neck cancer at very high rates in adulthood. But let me introduce you to Karen Anderson and, and Del Yarbrough's project in the SPORE. There's a observation from the T TCGA that there's striking differences in methylation between HPV negative and HPV positive uh, head and neck cancers. And Dell's lab had done work demonstrating that this methylation uh, induces immune silencing. And if you give a demethylating agent like 5-ASA, you downregulate HPV and MMP expression, you stabilize P53, and you induce apoptosis. So we ran a, a, a window trial of 5-ASA cytidine in HPV negative and HPV positive cancer. No effects in the HPV negative cancers, but in the HPV positive cancers, um, we saw um, uh, that uh, there was activation of um, 
type 1 interferon signaling upregulation of the gene editing protein apebec 3 b which increased double-strand um, DNA breaks. And um, there was activated T cell infiltration within tumors. And you see here um, photomicrographs before and after that were stained in David Rim's lab looking for um, CD4, CD8, and CD20 cells. And I just representatively have uh, shown you the CD8 counts within the tumor mask before and after 5-azocytidine. Um, so we are taking this um, forward now in a uh, spore uh, window trial, either 5-azocytidine alone, nivolumab alone, or the combination um, in the new adjuvant setting, and um, are um, also hoping to add to this uh, 18F ARAG uh, PET for non-invasive quantitation of activated T cell infiltration across the course of the neoadjuvant therapy and collecting samples for tumor neoantigen expression. Um, the cooperative groups are, uh, I think, an important venue for um, asking questions that are uh, closer to practice. And I've talked a lot about HPV negative disease and HPV positive disease. Our questions center more on how can we enhance uh, function preservation? And these are data we just presented at ASCO this year showing that if you take patients with uh, resectable stage HPV associated cancer to transoral resection, and then you have that pathologic staging from the surgical material in hand that really uh, permits much more dramatic uh, treatment deintensification than if you have to rely on, um, on clinical uh, variables. And so here you see that for um, favorable risk uh, surgical staging without any post-operative therapy, we had three-year progression-free survival approaching 97%. For the intermediate risk group, so this is uh, node positive, but no extra nodal extension, whether we gave 60 gray of radiation or 50 gray and shrank the fields, we maintained three-year progression-free survival of about 94%. And then even the very high-risk patients, we were able to de-intensify therapy by going to, to weekly chemotherapy in the post-op setting. Um, you'll see here that about a third of the patients on the trial ended up needing trimodality therapy. That is not the goal of treatment de-intensification. And so one question is, how can we better identify the patients who have a higher risk of, let's say, E&E &E or positive margin from uh, going on to a surgical trial because they ought to probably go straight to chemoradiation? Ben Kahn, who's now a junior faculty member at the Farber, but was a radiation oncology resident here, undertook a machine learning project where he developed a, a deep neural network um, algorithm for identifying extra nodal extension from a baseline CT scan. We've now validated that on the cooperative group trial um, in 76 patients. And this has uh, moved on to part of the University of Pittsburgh head neck spore that I'm a co-investigator on where we're going to be linking radiomic to genomic signatures so that we hopefully can have a better uh, means of identifying these high-risk patients at baseline. Um, in terms of policy, um, there uh, I think have been um, really a paucity of FDA approvals in head and neck uh, cancer, the approvals of pembrolizumab and nivolumab in 2017 were the first in uh, over a decade. And uh, these trials have become more difficult, certainly for the HPV-associated cancers where the event rates are quite low and designing randomized trials where you're looking to have something happen that's better than 94% at three years um, really becomes prohibitive in terms of size and duration. And although we see many ways that immunotherapy and targeted therapy could allow us to de-intensify trials, there is no accepted regulatory strategy for um, demonstrating that that's the case. So the goals of Project 2025 are to um, uh, find harmonized surrogate endpoints that uh, the FDA will accept. Um, they, uh, uh, you know, want to have um, public meeting with all the stakeholders uh, present that that will kind of refine. PFS probably looking better than local regional control. What's the role of following HPV circulating DNA? How do functional endpoints get defined to permit approval in the deintensification trial? And then the last thing that I think is really important for us is career development. And before I turn it over to RT, I just want to highlight that the SPORE does have developmental research and career enhancement programs that offer up to 50K uh, of pilot funding. 
our pay line is pretty good. We give out seven awards a year. We just had a cycle, but please think about us next year. So with that, I'm going to, um, uh, I think, not introduce uh, my two co-speakers because Roy Herbst did a very nice job with that. Um, just mention that obviously this work uh, was done by many, many people besides myself. Uh, thank my funding agencies and stop sharing so that I can turn it over to Dr. Bhatia. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for the opportunity to present here today. Um, I'll be talking briefly about research strategies that we have undertaken at Yale to overcome cetuximab resistance in head and neck cancers. Um, as we all know, cetuximab is a monoclonal antibody against EGFR, and it's the only approved targeted therapy for patients with head and neck cancers. Um, this approval was based on improved local regional control and survival when it was given concurrently with radiation in the locally advanced setting um, and due to improved PFS and OS when administered in combination with chemo um, in the recurrent metastatic setting. However, these effects are modest and the definitive setting in the definitive setting cetuximab in radiation um, is proven inferior to chemo radiation. Its clinical utility is limited primarily by um, either inherent or acquired resistance to therapy. Um, ligand binding of EGFR leads to homo and heterodimerization with other HER family receptors or other receptor tyrosine kinases such as MET and subsequent downstream signaling of MAP kinase, um, the PA3 kinase, mTOR pathway, RASRAF, MEC or pathway, or JAKSTAT. Um, and resistance can be mediated either by overexpression of EGFR or its ligands, as we see in head and neck cancers and in response to smoking. Um, it can be mediated by nuclear translocation of EGFR, where it stabilizes PCNA um, and um, enhances DNA repair and synthesis, um, or increase heterodimerization with other members of the HER family, um, HER2 and HER3, or with crosstalk with other receptor tyrosine kinases such as CMAT and VEGF. Um, and identifying effective means of sensitizing head and neck cancers to EGFR inhibition is an important goal um, for us and an important part of our SPORE project too. Prior research at Yale done on tissue microarrays that were constructed from oropharyngeal cancer specimens showed a significant association of nuclear EGFR with membranous EGFR expression and with nuclear PCNA. Um, and that suggested that EGFR functions as a tyrosine kinase in the nucleus where it stabilizes PCNA. The nuclear activity will, could therefore constitute a novel therapeutic target. Subsequent to that, we designed um, a phase two trial using a chemo backbone and dual EGFR blockade with cetuximab and erlotinib. Um, the rationale was that dual EGFR blockade would overcome EGFR overexpression and its ligand independent downstream signaling and show improved responses. The tumor biopsies were planned at baseline um, on treatment and at disease progression. And on coronative analysis, we found that nuclear PCNA staining, um, a decrease in the staining actually correlated with clinical response to treatment for several patients who had matched pre and post treatment biopsies. And that suggested that nuclear EGFR may also be inhibited with this combination. As a follow-up to that study, uh, we proposed and received NCCN funding for a phase two trial of cetuximab and afatinib in patients with platinum and mostly immune checkpoint inhibition head and neck cancers, where really no effective and approved treatments exist. This trial is ongoing uh, for a target accrual of 50 patients. We have already accrued 38. Um, tissue for correlatives is being obtained both pre, pre and post treatment for most patients. Um, and existing funding from NCCN and the Patterson Foundation will support um, quantitative immunohistochemical assessment of the known biomarkers of resistance to EGFR inhibition, um, namely P10, phospho-ERK, phospho-AKT, um, and PCNA. Um, tumor biopsies from patients on this trial will also be used in project one of the SPORE to establish PDXs in immune deficient mice. Um, and recent structural insights into TKI binding have shown that stabilization of receptor activation states, um, for instance, after heterodimerization with 
HER3 um, produces EGFR conformations that do not bind inhibitors like lipatinib and efatinib, and that could lead to resistance. So the goal is to identify TKIs that bind to EGFR conformations that are occurring in head and neck cancers or those that are not restricted by confirmation state dependent binding and to test the effectiveness of these compounds in head and neck cancers. So PDXs derived from uh, biopsies from patients on the trial will be treated with EGFR directed TKIs, um, which retain efficacy against HER3 and EGFR heterodimers. We also received uh, recent Department of Defense funding to uh, define the relationship between TP53 genotype, aurora kinase expression, and response to EGFR inhibition using patient samples from the same NCCN trial. Um, in the absence of TP53 or in the presence of TPX2, aurora kinase is highly expressed, and it provides an alternative mechanism of downstream signaling of EGFR. Um, using the tissue samples from the trial, uh, we will be um, able to determine if the combination, um, I'm sorry, whether TP53 mutation will predict for baseline or post-treatment resistance, um, and whether aurora kinase and TPX2 levels are predictive biomarkers of non-response to dual EGFR inhibition and correlate with a shorter survival. Also using post-treatment biopsies, we can determine whether a rise in aurora kinase levels uh, will predict for disease progression following progression, clinical progression on treatment. Yale's also participated in um, a multi-institutional IIT um, of um, a hepatocyte growth factor c met pathway inhibitor, ficlituzumab, in combination with cetuximab in patients who have previously progressed on cetuximab. Um, there is crosstalk between EGFR and the CMET pathways, and it's a known tumor intrinsic resistance mechanism. A phase one trial of this combination showed a response rate of 17% in cetuximab resistant patients, um, and a subsequent randomized phase two trial showed a response rate of 38% in HPV negative patients, and these results were presented at ASCO this year. So while Keynote 048 has established the role of immune checkpoint inhibition in the first-line treatment of head and neck cancers, um, cetuximab continues to hold a place in the treatment of this disease, and it, it is one of the most frequently chosen second-line treatment in combination with chemotherapy for patients who came off Keynote 048 on the Pembro monotherapy arm. We now seek to um, explore the best second-line treatment options for head and neck cancers, and multiple lines of evidence have suggested that head neck tumors are frequently hypoxic and have elevated VEGF signaling, which is associated with immunosuppression um, via, jack, via the STAT3 signaling pathway or impairment of dendritic cell maturation, um, induction of immunosuppressive populations such as MDSCs and Tregs, um, and reduced recruitment of cytotoxic effectors, um, including CD8 cells, uh, T CD8 positive T cells and natural killer cells. So we postulate that VEGF blockade with bevacizumab will reverse these suppressive mechanisms and lead to improved anti-tumor immunity and clinical responses in patients who were previously treated with immune checkpoint inhibition. The combination of immunotherapy and VEGF inhibition has also shown excellent clinical efficacy in other solid tumor types, including renal cell, lung and hepatocellular, and was recently approved as first-line treatment for HCC. And in head and neck, we had a phase 1b trial looking at the combination of Pembro and Linvatinib, which showed a response rate of 36% and a PFS of 8.2 months. So we designed um, a phase 2 slash 3 trial through EPOC. Um, there will be three arms in the initial phase 2 portion of this study. We chose chemo and cetuximab as the control arm because that was the regimen most patients coming off of Keynote 048 went on to. Um, and the two experimental arms are chemo and bevacizumab and atezolizumab and bevacizumab. Um, 216 patients will be randomized in the initial phase two part of the trial. Um, and the winner of the phase two portion will then move to phase three against the standard chemo cetux arm. And another 214 patients will be randomized in phase three for a total sample size of 430. Um, expected study duration is about four and a half years. We expect the study to actually be activated soon. Um, we are collaborating with um, Jeff Ishizuka on the tissue correlatives. And at the end of the phase three portion, we hope to have a clear answer for best second line treatment moving forward. 
um, that's all I have for my work here so far. Um, I'll pass it on to Melissa. Can we stop screen sharing? All right, no, and thank you. I'll try to get my screen up next. And um, again, I, I wanna thank everyone here for the opportunity to discuss. It's, it's such an honor to, to be able to speak um, in combination with Dr. Burtness and Dr. Bhatia. Um, and I look forward to um, the years um, that we have in the future to continue these projects that we're all excited about. Part of what I wanted to do today in terms of um, my um, brief presentation was to really also, while we're focusing a lot on the head and neck dart and, and the spore that we have funding for and how we're incorporating that to the clinical trial um, progression at Yale, um, didn't want to discount the, the contribution um, that the radiation oncology dart also does. And we, we work co very collaboratively collaboratively between the two organizations um, and DARTs. So I wanted to kind of highlight some of the trials that we do have open and some of the hope that, that we'll be able to help contribute both with um, supporting the head and neck DART, but also with the um, head and neck spore. I have no disclosures and I'm not going to spend a lot of time. I know we're running a little short on time, but as everyone here knows that, you know, head and neck squamous cell carcinoma is uh, very common with at least 64,000 cases in the United States. And this is reiterating some of what Dr. Burtness had previously already mentioned is that um, the head and neck uh, location of cancer is a very sensitive part of the body. And um, it's very important with how we interact with society, maintain nutrition, communicate, um, and, and it's what is especially in a pandemic, how we visualize each other, it's how, how we see each other and communicate orally. So currently, as we know that in order to provide curative treatment for people who are non-metastatic, that is usually um, some form of local therapy, which may be surgery or radiation, or sometimes a combination of both, which carries a lot of potential risk for functional impairment, whether it's related to surgical changes, um, scar tissue from both surgery, radiation, um, swallowing dysfunction, um, pain, um, dry mouth, you know, complications that can arise from dental health and other things that, that come down the line after as a consequence of the curative of intent treatment. So while patients may be cured, they could be left with lifelong implications of their treatment. And some of the goals that we have both at Yale, but also across the country and the world are to understand how we can try to reduce the morbidity of that treatment without compromising cure rates. But also importantly, we still have a long ways to go in certain disease sites. We've already heard a lot about the P16 negative population and disease resistance and um, how can we overcome treatment resistance, but also um, prevent further morbidity of, of the treatment that we provide. Some of what's been touched on already is, is the importance and, and recognition of immune checkpoint inhibitors, certainly other disease sites um, and FDA approvals have come along showing activity in other disease sites. And we now see data showing the efficacy that immune checkpoint inhibitors appear to have both um, also in head and neck cancer as well. Um, and therefore, um, while a lot of initial data has indicated efficacy in the metastatic setting, we're also now looking to see how this might be incorporated in the upfront definitive setting um, and whether or not that might also provide some opportunity for either a reduced dose of radiation, reduced um, need for cytotoxic chemotherapy, um, but still maintaining um, um, uh, equivalent cure rates um, as to what we already have. So a lot of these trials are now moving into the definitive setting um, looking at multiple different immune check point inhibitors that I've got listed here. Um, some of the former trials that we are now in, in either actively enrolling on through the head and neck um, through the head and neck dart, um, but also previously open trials that are now in their follow-up phase have, have used immune checkpoint inhibitors in the upfront setting, whether it was in um, uh, Keynote 412 where immune checkpoint inhibitor Pimbro was added in conjunction with chemo radiation, but also in the maintenance phase. We are currently enrolling um, uh, on the ECOG Akron 3161 that is looking at addition of ad, um, adjuvant immunotherapy after an initial phase of definitive chemo radiotherapy. And there have been some phase one trials, including HNO3 that have looked at how immunotherapy may play some role um, 
and also safety in the adjuvant setting after surgery. One of the trials that we currently have open through the, the radiation oncology DART is looking at how immunotherapy may um, perhaps improve efficacy in a, in a high risk population. So specifically, this is looking at patients who have positive margin or um, extranodal extension after um, initial surgical resection of locally advanced head and neck cancer. Um, and patients are currently standard of care as radiation cisplatin, um, but this is now heading into the phase three design um, and activation. And this is now exploring the combination of docetaxel, cetuximab with radiotherapy versus cisplatin with the addition of immunotherapy, this one being a TESO. Um, and this has been, a, um, unfortunately, I, I must admit, a, a, a high accruing trial in part, I think, again, we're seeing this um, um, phenomenon of increased um, um, a higher stage disease, more locally advanced disease, especially as patients have, have had maybe some delays in their care from COVID. And so we have, we have actually been accruing to this at a, at a rather high rate and we look forward to the results to come. We're also, as I alluded to, looking at how um, um, uh, we might be able to improve our definitive intent. And there's certain populations where we have some room to improve. And one of that population is the cisplatin and eligible group of patients um, has already been alluded to. So I won't get into the, the details of the data, but as was previously mentioned, cetuximab um, does have some improvement. The Bonner trials had indicated some improvement over radiotherapy alone, but when compared to cisplatin, um, it is inferior. Although we do have that group of patients that are ineligible for cisplatin and cetuximab may be that, that therapy that we have. And so HNO4 is now looking at whether or not we can take those patients who are in, ineligible for cisplatin and compare how they might do and compare to cetuximab. So this is using Enderva as an immunotherapy um, and whether or not this might also provide meaningful outcomes, help radiosensitize those patients who are not otherwise eligible for cytotoxic chemotherapy. This is um, open to more advanced P16 um, and higher risk P16 positive population, but also the P16 negative population population, both stage three and stage four cancers. Um, and then also a trial that we have been um, enrolling on with at least about seven patients currently on study in, in its um, current state. And then lastly, um, in terms of deintensification, it is certainly one of our goals as has also been mentioned, the HPV population has been recognized as having a better prognosis than that of the P16 population. And across the country, we're now trying to tease out how, what, how might we be able to um, safely de-intensify in therapy um, and the ECOG Akron 3311, or the, sorry, I should say the ECOG 3311 is kind of one example of where there might be some opportunity re to reduce um, um, treatment, but the outcomes and the, the number of failures are low because this is a relatively good prognosis population. So we have to think about this meaningfully and carefully um, and whether or not that's some combination of reducing radiation dose, whether or not it's a combination of surgery with reduced um, radiation dose. Um, I'm not going to be talking about any kind of induction, you know, systemic therapy followed by or dose reduced or risk adjust adjusted local therapy, but certainly a lot of different ways in which this could be explored. And we are going to be looking to move, um, uh, we're moving to open HNO5, which is looking at our low risk P16 population to a de-intensified protocol kind of as a, a jumping point from previously published results of HNO2 that had shown um, reasonably good two-year progression-free survival of 90% with a, um, instead of our typical 70 gray of radiation, instead 60 gray of radiation with cisplatin. Um, omitting the cisplatin did, did cross to lower um, progression-free survival. So HNO5 is looking to keep the 60 gray with cisplatin arm, but also then looking at a somewhat escalated or hyper-accelerated radiation delivery of 60 gray over five weeks with the addition of immunotherapy to compare how that may, may relate to the standard of care 70 gray and cisplatin versus 60 gray and cisplatin. So we do look forward to, to opening this. This is a specific population that we don't have a lot of um, um, uh, trial opportunity and clinical trial opportunity and look forward to, to providing more options and contributing to um, important questions nationally and internationally. 
And then in terms of the future goals for our therapeutic radiation oncology DART in combination with how we interface with all of the other DARTs that we work with, but today specifically the head and, neck, head and neck DART, you know, our goal is to continue to collaborate with the SPORE. A lot of the physicians that Dr. Burtness had previously indicated at the beginning of her slides, there were at least six physicians just from radiation oncology faculty alone who are part of, of this um, combined effort. Uh, we have a lot of um, clinician scientists who are actively engaged in DNA repair and, and how we might be able to improve outcomes. And this fits nicely with the, the um, purpose and, and goal of the head and neck spore. Um, and we'll also could be continuing to, to support the head and neck dart with the trials that we're able to open our resources as well. Um, also, we want to continue to open cooperative group trials that will align with the needs of our, our patient population here in Connecticut um, and continue to assess that and make sure that we're, we're opening trials that are appropriate for our community efforts. And then lastly, as was also alluded to, um, outcomes are better at high volume centers. So as we continue to expand and, and need to serve a, a greater um, expansive community across the entire state of Connecticut and our department, we are working um, very vigorously of, of maintaining high quality at our care centers, specifically really Waterford and Trumbull, in addition to our main campus here in New Haven. So we, we have extensive efforts in standardizing our radiation treatment planning, um, ensuring we have quality across the system. How we do that is multifactorial, but certainly we have peer review of all of our cases. We, we review them regularly, whether patients are on or off clinical trial to make sure that we have um, and maintain quality. All the physicians that participate in any head and neck treatment under satellites are also attending these multidisciplinary tumor boards and, and many of us also attend multidisciplinary clinics as well. So we're very engaged with the, with the head and neck team. any of the cooperative groups that have external review required as part of our radiation planning have, have identified no concerns um, with um, our radiation planning. And then lastly, I think one of the things that is important is that we work very hard to make sure that we have the, the clinical support services that are key. So the speech language pathology, the social work that was mentioned, the surgical resources and expert, uh, experts on site so that we can make sure to um, appropriately um, um, triage our patients as, as they go through their treatment, but also have the um, same high quality surveillance and, and also support as they are in their survivorship from head and neck cancer. And all combined, I think this will help continue to improve um, access as, as, as well as improve clinical trial, uh, trial enrollment everywhere. And with that, I want to, uh, I'll, I'll stop here. I want to thank everybody again. I, I don't have an acknowledgement slide, but certainly everyone that Dr. Burtness had mentioned, plus our clinical trials team has been very critical in our ability to, to do what we've been able to do and serve um, our patients here in Connecticut. Okay, thanks, Melissa. We have time for a couple of questions. Uh, please put them into the chat, or if you want, we'll uh, unmute you so you can speak. Uh, while I'm waiting for a few, I'll just say, Melissa, I, I was very impressed by the multimodality nature of care and the fact that you're running these trials at all the different centers. So what's the secret? We need more trials like that, you know, higher crewing, um, you know, where you, 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 you can't, can't uh, it, it, it's a very prevalent type of disease with a trial that I guess the eligibility criteria are, are quite broad to allow most patients to enroll. Yeah, I, I think that's part of it is um, as we, as our darts and Dr. Burtness can, can attest to this too, we really try to understand what's going to likely accrue for our current patient population. And I think that that's been key, but also making sure to advertise it. And, and I think because our physicians have been so engaged at the other centers, we're able to get these opened and enrolled at the care centers. Sometimes we're able to meet these patients locally. I think that's been a huge part of our success um, is, is making sure those patients who, especially if they're seen in New Haven, are, are seeing all of us and, and have, have full venue and access to understanding every, every clinical trial available to them. Great, thanks. We have, a, we have a question from Tommy. Tommy, you want to uh, unmute and we'll let you uh, uh, ask your question. Yes. Uh, first of all, uh, Barbara and, uh, your, and also others, I think that the progress in this uh, area is really very impressive. My question to you is um, all of your strategies go after the tumor. What is happening? after those combinations in terms of adverse effects. 
is it getting worse for the same or big or next? And uh, as you know, the therapeutic index is the most important part of the, the treatment, one of the most important. So could you comment on those? And in particular, you several, all you are being involved in using antibody, immediate checkpoint, plus the in, uh, impact on the antibody uh, the, uh, uh, combination on the ADA. In other words, the antibody uh, induced the antibody response. Is that a getting more or less or, or what? So could you sort of comment on this? So, so maybe I'll start and then I'll pass it to, to Melissa because I think uh, radiation has its, its whole own um, story with the toxicity. In terms of the combination of pembrolizumab with chemotherapy, it did not lead to more toxicity than pembrolizumab with cetuximab. And pembrolizumab alone was a lot less toxic than the combination. Um, the, th there is a suggestion that there is a little bit of intensification of the myelosuppression when you give pembrolizumab chemo relative to cetuximab chemo. And although it didn't lead to a significant increase in the number of deaths, we did see more tumor bleeding uh, when we used pembro or pembro chemo. Um, and that I, I think may have to do with uh, uh, loss of the immune checkpoint uh, as, as regards the interaction of the activated T cells with the, the wall of these damaged blood vessels within the tumors. Um, these, are, um, these antibodies are not inducing a, a high rate of uh, uh, anti-humanized antibody antibodies. Um, so overall, I would say our experience with toxicity is this, this subgroup of patients who have uh, high-grade immune-related adverse events, and other than that, uh, not really worse than it used to be in, in the prior era. And then, Melissa, I don't know if you want to talk about, as we've added the immune checkpoint inhibitors to radiation. So certainly some of the initial patients that we've followed, I, I think there's the immune, so we talk about potentially using immune therapies as something to avoid cytotoxic, but certainly there's the immune concern and we certainly are seeing activation of psoriasis, skin conditions, you know, anything underlying, the, those are the things that I think we're still learning to manage in terms of toxicity during radiation have not necessarily seen any worse toxicity during the actual course of radiation and these initial patients that have been on these combined modality therapy, but there are different things that we're having to think about, you know, when do we, you know, we're having to determine whether or not we're needing to add steroids at any point along the way, different toxicities that we didn't necessarily have to think about checking for during radiation for definitive intent treatment. But I think that is what we are continuing to learn. And for these trials, the, the information we gain from these trials and toxicity assessments will be very important in determining, is this a way of de-intensifying? Uh, we're, we're just a so oh, go ahead. We're just about over time, but um, I know Mike Hurwitz has a question too, but you can do a quick follow-up, Tommy. Okay. In terms of skin toxicity, your EGFR inhibitor for body cause skin. And also the other antibody also cause skin. So what happened if you use combination, as I think was mentioned, it's getting worse. But that is a quite a, a, a very unpleasant toxicity patient have if you have a skin issues. So I don't know if, if RT wants to address the afantinib cetuximab has been associated with a fair bit of skin toxicity that responds to steroids. Cetuximab pembro has been reported now in head and neck cancer to be quite active um, without really much of a, a difference in the safety signal. Okay. So, um, at, you know, I think there's there's obviously still a lot to learn with these regimens that are reported with 30 patients, but um, I, I think we're all quite intrigued by the possibility of the IO anti-EGFR combinations. Uh -huh. Okay, and then the final question, Mike Horwitz, you've had your hand up a long time. Uh, is this Noah, Noah Horowitz? Mark Horowitz. Yes. So first, I'd like to comment. Number one, I had an HPV positive tumor uh, that I was seeing uh, at Yale, 
fortunately Dr. Badia, I was my oncologist and Dr. Young was my radiation oncologist and uh, Schumer was eventually rejected by Dr. Uh, Judson and the repairs done by Dr. Mayra. And I can tell you that I received superior care by this team uh, and their experience uh, is just fantastic. So I'm a year and a half out, tumor free, uh, and couldn't be uh, happier. I'm back in my lab in the Department of Orthopedics, uh, working away. So thank you all. Um, uh, I, I one quick question. I don't know if it's for Dr. Body or for Dr. Burton, is, but do you see an influx of macrophages, uh, F480 positive cells, uh, in or around? Uh, HPV positive tumors uh, in the presence of patients who are treated with the um, uh, checkpoint inhibitors versus controls. So um, I think less so than um, the infiltration of T cells. It is well understood that um, particularly in the more hypoxic and HPV negative head and neck cancers, there is at baseline quite a lot of, um, of, of extensive macrophage population and that it's sort of M2 polarized and um, may correspond to the, the macrophage populations that have been defined in preclinical models for um, uh, predicting hyperprogression, for example, in, in non-small cell lung cancer. So um, I think still a lot of work to be done there, but the the response when someone's responding seems to be uh, that we're seeing an, an ingress of T cells. Thank you. Well, and, and thank you, thank you for your wonderful comment and for telling the whole world what uh, how lucky I am to work with these two. <laughs> uh, it's just the truth. Just the truth. Well, well, you know, um, that's a great way to end. And you know, the patient care comes first, and the the amazing work that you're all doing. And we have a, an example right here. So. Keep it up, um, lab to clinic, clinic to lab, you know, uh, multimodality care. It's exactly what we all aspire to. So thank you all for coming to Grand Rounds today and we'll see you next week.